The LZX Fortress is a 3-bit computational graphics system based on the LZX Castle series of modules. The Fortress is a very high-quality system designed to make low-resolution graphics. Textures and shapes reminiscent of vintage video games and antique computer systems are easily achieved. At its core, Fortress combines three voltage-controlled oscillators with three analog-to-digital converters. These can be combined using a number of different programs and can then be output using a set of preset color palettes. It also works extremely well with other aspects of your system, thanks to dedicated outputs and voltage-controlled inputs. First, let's look at using the module with no patching at all and quickly jump through some of the different modes and options. To begin, let's explore the three oscillators. Each of the three oscillators has a dedicated output. I'm going to use these so we can see clearly what's going on. So oscillator 1 goes directly out to the oscillator 1 output, and it's also distributed throughout other parts of the system, which we'll talk about later. Each of the three oscillators in Fortress is dedicated to a different range. Oscillator 1 is a video rate range oscillator, which means we get vertical bars. You can also modulate the frequency with an external voltage control input. And if you change the counting switches, you get more divisions and different shapes. So while it defaults to a basic square, you can also get a triangle shape and uh, two different variations of a sawtooth. Oscillator 2 is an audio rate oscillator, which means we get horizontal bars. Again, it can be frequency modulated. And again, we have counting switches to change the basic overall shape. Oscillator 3 is a low frequency oscillator. It goes from very fast strobing to just a few seconds per cycle. And again, we could switch counting switches to get slightly different shapes. Each of these oscillators are pre-patched internally to the three analog to digital converters in the Fortress. Each of the three oscillators is pre-patched internally to the three analog to digital converters. As I turn up the voltage control amount, you'll start to see oscillator one appear in ADC1. If something was patched into here, that connection disappears. But oscillator one is still available on its own individual output. I'm gonna switch the count up so that we have more divisions. And as I bring this into the analog to digital converter, you can start to see what's happening. So each ADC takes the input signal and divides it into eight slices. The way they interact with each other is based on the program, which is set with these three switches. So right now I have oscillator one going into ADC one. I can bring oscillator two into ADC two. With all my program switches down, I'm in a basic compositing mode. And what this does is it takes ADC1 and ADC2 and combines them based on the position of ADC3. ADC3 has eight possible mathematic or logical operations. As you move the slider, you can get a feel for the different modes. In addition to basic adding and subtracting, it also features logical operators like AND, OR, and XOR. After the signal is processed by ADC3, it goes to a palette selection. The raw ADC3 output is also available from the DAC output. We'll take a look at this really quickly. So this is a grayscale version of whatever is coming out of ADC3. These grayscale values are running through the palette selector to choose the colors that come from the RGB. Having this available on its own separate output opens up a lot of opportunities outside of the module, however. And ADC3 can be modulated with oscillator 3 which again is a low frequency output. So let's look at a few of the different program modes. With all three switches down, you're in the basic compositor mode. If I switch the first switch up, you go into RGB shift register mode. If we just put the D1 switch up, we're now in cellular autonomous mode. And if we put both of these switches up, we're in linear feedback shift register mode. While the ins and outs of how these different modes work is pretty interesting, don't get overwhelmed if it all just sounds like gobbledygook. In the end, it doesn't really matter if you technically understand what the different modes are doing, as long as you start to get a feel for the different effects they can produce. 
In any mode other than the compositor mode, which is when all three switches are down, the oscillators play a secondary role. So I'm going to bring this voltage control amount all the way down. So we're taking the oscillators out of ADC1 and ADC2 completely. And then I'm going to switch up to cellular autonomous mode by pushing the D1 switch up. Cellular autonoma is a type of random pattern creation based largely on organic systems. But as you can see, even without the oscillators patched into the ADCs, I'm still seeing a pattern. This is because the cellular autonoma uses the two oscillators to generate a clock for its patterns. As I go through ADC2, this will move through different variations for the autonomous pattern. Similarly, if I go to linear feedback shift register mode, which is the DO and D1 switches up, I get a similar effect, but this time it's a pseudo random value. This mode is a different variation of a random pattern. And again, the clocks are defined by oscillator one and oscillator two. In the RGB shift register mode, which is selected by just having the first switch in the up position, ADC two creates a delayed version of ADC one. So let me turn this up a little bit. Turn this one up a little bit. This can give you stair-stepping effects in a variety of other interesting waveforms. By changing the counting, we can get slightly different shapes. So there are four basic modes you can access with the program switches. You'll notice I haven't talked about D2 yet. D2 basically takes any mode and adds a little bit of animation to it. The speed will be affected by oscillator 3. But oscillator 2 and oscillator 1 will have an effect as well. The switches below will now affect the direction of your movement. So you can think of the D2 program switch as your animation on off button. You can similarly think of ADC3 as your master compositing output option. No matter which program mode you're in, the combination of ADC1 and ADC2 is dictated by the position of the ADC3 slider. And of course, you can always add the output from oscillator 3 into the ADC control. Because each of the oscillators is available on its own output, you can also use them to cross-modulate each other. So I'm going to plug the direct output of oscillator 2 into the voltage control of oscillator 1. And that allows me to explore some different shapes. I can plug the output of oscillator 3 into oscillator 2 and get a little movement. Now it's important to remember when modulating that you always want to use a slower oscillator to modulate a faster one. So if you tried to modulate oscillator 2 with oscillator 1, it wouldn't work out so well. And of course, switch to the different palette modes. You can also take the DAC output and plug that back into the voltage control of any of the ADCs. This is going to create a feedback loop. So in ADC2, it's going to have a more subtle effect. If I move that to ADC3, we start to get some very pronounced feedback. I'll slow this down. And we could try this patch with some different modes. So there you have a very basic demonstration of some of what you can do with Fortress. While it's a very capable all-in-one module for generating low-resolution textures and graphics, it's also exceptional at interacting with other aspects of your system. In this patch, we're going to explore using the oscillators with external modules. So whenever I begin patching Fortress, I like to make sure all of my program and palette switches are in the down position, and all of my oscillator count switches are either all the way down or all the way up. All the way down will give you a square wave. All the way up gives you a stepped triangle wave. Make sure all of your CV controls are down to zero. And with this patch, I'm gonna begin by taking my one and two oscillators and mixing them together via a passage. Let me show you what this looks like. So these oscillators basically function the same as any other oscillator in your system. 
You can mix them, combine them, and play with them in different ways. So as you can see, the passage is allowing me to combine the horizontal and vertical oscillators. So I can take this output, and let's go back into ADC2 and start to All right. So even just simple act of adding a mixer into the chain before hitting one of the ADCs gives me an entirely new world of patterns to explore. Of course, if I switch the different count modes, this gives me a variety of different shapes. So we'll go back all up. If I want to add some animation to this, I could take that output into the crossfader of a pendulum. We'll take that output back into ADC2, and we'll patch an LFO into the cross VC. So now this starts to give me a little bit of animation in my texture. I never want it to turn all the way off, so I'm gonna adjust those a little bit. So we can also start to get other oscillators involved. So I'm gonna take a prismatic ray and use that to frequency modulate oscillator one. This oscillator is set to a very slow scrolling speed. If you wanna see what it's doing, there it is. Scrolling so slow you can't even see it. There we go. I'll switch back and frequency modulation into channel one. So now we're starting to get a nice weaving pattern. I also have my low frequency oscillator, oscillator three. I'm going to patch that out and I'm going to use that to control the pedestal in the prismatic ray. So now this LFO is going to affect how much of that modulation we're getting. You could also patch another pattern into ADC1. In this case, I'm just going to use a simple ramp. Turn that up. And this will start to give a little bit more complexity to my pattern. From here, we can experiment with different palettes. We can adjust the manual slider controls. And finally, we can begin to select the different program modes, which will give us very dramatically different results. And again, by switching the different count positions, we can get different types of triangles, pyramids, and other shapes. If I change oscillator controls. So even with just a few other modules, we can greatly extend the possibilities of the fortress. In this patch, we're going to look at how we can combine the three analog digital converters with external signals. This is probably the most generally flexible part of the system, as each of the ADCs is capable of taking an incoming image and breaking it into eight slices. This gives a kind of quantized colorization effect that's not too dissimilar from a keyer. So I wanna make sure that all my CV inputs are down and all my switches are down. I'm keeping my palette up because that's the palette I've chosen. So now I'm gonna take a ramp into analog digital converter one. And as I start to bring up the attenuator, you start to see a very sharp key. So what's happening is the input signal that goes from black to white is being split into eight different frequency bands. Those are then being passed through a logic operation and onto the palette. If I move through the different ADC3 options, you'll start to see some different color options. These will become even stronger once we have something plugged into ADC2. So for that, I'm gonna take a horizontal ramp, plug it into a staircase. This should just give me some nice vertical bars to play with. And if I bring up ADC2, our vertical bars. Okay, so because our program switches are all the way down, we're now in a mode where ADC1 is being combined with ADC2 based on a function provided by ADC3. So with the slider all the way down, we're at add, 
I move it up a little bit, it's now subtracting the two signals. Up one more, and we get a logical AND, a logical OR, logical XOR, NAND, NOR, and XNOR. Now the cool thing about this is that even if you didn't want to use it for anything else, you could use this module to replicate a two-input logic utility. For example, I can just set this to OR, and if we look directly at the DAC output, which bypasses the palette controls, we now have a pure logical OR of the two sliced signals. So now we can begin looking at the different program modes. If I switch DO up, we are now in our basic shift register mode. Oscillator 1 now has influence over the pattern, as we are seeing the difference between the frequency of oscillator 1 and our inputs into the ADCs. And again, I can switch through my logical modes, and we can now generate spaceships for your favorite Atari 2600 video game. If we go into cellular autonomous mode, we'll get some more chaotic variations of the same basic idea. I can slide through ADC2 and get different variations. In this mode, if I push the D2 switch up, we'll start to get animation based on the speed of oscillator 3. Finally, we can look at the linear feedback shift register mode. In this case, our two oscillators are serving as a clock. And we can get some much more intricate patterns. And of course, we can keep scrolling through the different ADC3 modes. So finally, I'm going to add a little bit of modulation to ADC3. I'm going to split the signal coming from my ramp. Go into a passage. Take the output from passage into my VC on ADC3. And I'll get a prismatic ray that's scrolling. And I'll start to bring this up. And I'll start to introduce the modulation from the prismatic ray. There we go. So now that'll start to give me some color modulation. Flip on D2, get some animation coming from oscillator 3. I can change the direction of that. And from here you can start playing with all your different options. You should find a lot of different patterns to explore. You could start changing ramp shapes. And of course, you can combine this with the oscillator effects we saw earlier in this video. With all of the different program modes, the different inputs and outputs available, Fortress could keep you busy for a lifetime. Hopefully this video showed you some useful tips and tricks to get started integrating Fortress with other video modules. There will be a part two to this video in which we specifically explore working with external video inputs in Fortress. Thanks for watching, and as always, please leave any questions or ideas for future videos in the comments below.